Classes member of Jared Orchen, and today we learn the after of the second day of Shavuos on page 1523. The after of the second day of Shavuos is from the book of Chavakuk, Abakuk in English. He, who is the prophet Chavakuk? What do you know about him? Uh, there's a lot that's not known about him. This is true. He was the, the Elisha, son of the Shunammite woman. Some opinion, yeah, the Talmud says that Habakkuk is the, you know the story with Elisha, the, who revived a child who died. That's why, why, why the rabbi says it was him. Habakkuk is from the expression chovek, lachvok, to hog. Elisha promised the mother that he will, she will hog a son. And then he came and he hugged them seven times, right? He lay down on them. That they say that Habakkuk is the child who was revived. Very good. When was Chav- the time, the time of period of time when Habakkuk was alive? It's not clear. According to many commentaries, he lived a little bit before the destruction of the first temple. Then it doesn't work so much with the, with the Elisha because Elisha was much earlier than that, right? Was he Northern Kingdom or Southern Kingdom or both, if we know? I think it was already after the kingdoms. Yeah. Yeah. Only one kingdom available. Mm-hmm. Now, the book of Habakkuk is three chapters. That's it. Three chapters. There is Treyasa. There is the, the, a, bo- a group of, of prophets in one book who are very, very small uh, prophets, very small books there. For who else is in this book? Twelve books. And Amos. Amos, Hosea, Hosea Ovadia, yeah. Obadiah, uh, Nahum, Nahum, um, Michal, Malachi, Malachi, uh, Zechariah, Haggai. Haggai, Haggai, and Malachi, yeah. Uh, there are twelve of them. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Jonah? Right? Yeah, Jonah, Jonah is in this book, yes, yes, yes. Mm-hmm. Then, what is Habakkuk saying? What he wants? What is Habakkuk's message? Here we're going to read chapter 3, the last chapter in the book of Habakkuk. What is he saying in, in book 1 and book 2? Eh, in chapter 1 and chapter 2. First of all, the Medrash says, the Talmud says it. Then um, Moses said to, to be a Jew, you have to have 630 mitzvahs. Then came King David and said that there is 11 things you can do and that will keep you as a Jew. He took chapter, I think, 15 in the book of Psalms and he, and he, he said that he says uh, uh, to be honest and to be, to be a straight person and all the mitzvahs that are men and men, that will, that will keep you a, a straight person. Then the, 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 the Talmud goes to other prophets who said, it takes three things to be, to be the, the, the main thing to be a Jew. And then we finally come to Havakuk, Bo Havakuk ve'emidon alachas. Havakuk says it's all about one thing. Tzadik be'emunato yichir. A tzadik will live by his faith. Faith in God. Believe in God, trust in God. That's all it's all about. That's how Havakuk put it. Havakuk in his first chapter, is complaining to God. What's going on in the world? Why bad thing happens to good people? We think we invented the question. Rabbi Kushner wrote the book, Why Bad Things Happen to Good People. I have some news for you. A little before him, somebody asked the question. And before Habakkuk also people asked the question. Moses asked the question. And Abraham asked the question. The judge of the, of the hurt of the universe will not serve justice? This question is an old question. Habakkuk was really frustrated and he asked the question, why is it you see, you see is such evil going on in the world and you do nothing? What was the answer? Don't, don't say that. The answer, Habakkuk says, I'm not going, I'm not leaving. Sorry, until I get a good answer. 
He stood, he said, I'm standing in one place and I'm not moving. God, give me an answer. God gave him an answer. The answer was, eventually it's going to be everything understood, everything in the good will prevail. But wait, if it tarries, or tarry, you know, if it, if it's not, if it's t- it delays, wait for it. And which prayer will say this? If it delays, you should wait for it. Not the Amida. Not the Amida. It's not in the Chabad prayer book. But it's there. You know, if you know, you know about the 13 principles of faith that my mother mm-hmm. saw. You don't. You know. Yeah. What's number 12? Uh, waiting for the Messiah. Waiting for the Messiah. And if he doesn't, he doesn't tarry, he doesn't tarry. Yeah. If he tarries, uh, yeah. wait. What? Still the waiting. Still one. wait for him. Every Where day. they took it? They took it from Chavako. Chavako gave us. Oh. Principle number 12. Moshiach doesn't come immediately. Don't lose it. Wait. It will come eventually. That was Chavakov's answer from God to him that eventually it's going to be good. Chapter number 3. Chavakuk is apologizing to God for questioning him. The Medrash says four prophets, four people question God and apologize to God later. Moses, I think David, Jeremiah, and Habakkuk. Or complaining to God, how did the, the, the evil are successful? And after they got the answer, they said, oh, I'm sorry, God, for, for asking. It's a normal reaction to ask, what's going on here? And then, as, as the expression is, what in a, in a second thought, what again, I understand, it makes sense. God, I understand that I don't, it makes sense that I don't understand. I'm not surprised I don't understand. But you started off saying that the tzaddik was by its face, so then why, why would a tzaddik That's what he got the, in the, the second, question. that's oh. what he got in the second chapter. That's the answer. That's the answer that Chavaku got from God. In the question, he didn't have it. Tzaddik b'monotor, that's the answer. Now, the idea that Chavakuk was standing in a, in a, in a, in standing and saying, I'm not moving until I get an answer. What is this reminding you? Honey the circle drawer. Oh. Moses. Honey the circle drawer. And you say, Moses? Yeah, yeah, we are, we are, we are. <laughs> He's beseeching God not to destroy the... His, not to destroy the Israelites. First of all, there's a famous story about Honey the circle drawer. What's the story? The story is that once they were in need for rain, right? The Jewish people were in need for rain. They came to Choni. Choni was a very righteous man who lived during the second temple, during the time of the Maccabees. And they came and they said to him, pray for us for rain. He prayed, but it didn't work. And what he did? He went in a, in a circle, made a circle around them. And he said to God, I swear by the name of God that I'm not moving from here until it's raining. That's being a serious business. What happened? Well, that got a little too much rain. Yeah. No, it started rain to drop. Very oh, Very little. But the disciples told them, Rabbi, we want to live to be able to see you. If this is the rain that's going on, we will die. Looks like God is giving the drops just to get you out of your oath. You made an oath just to get you out of trouble. That's not the rain. That, that honey turned to God and says, God, I want rain to fill up the ditches, the pools, the, the, all the, the pits for the water. Rain! Well, then happened the other side. What happened? It started to pour in a way that the world would be destroyed. They told them, Rabbi, we want to leave to see you. 
With this rain, we will not be able to see you. Chani turned to God and says, God, give us a rain that the children of Israel can take. It has started to rain normally, but a lot, like in a tornado, storm. And all the Jews had to run to the mountains. They told Rabbi, you will not survive such a rain either. Chani says, I cannot pray to God to take away a blessing. Bring me an offering, and I give and I offer to God a thanksgiving offering for the miracle. And then he asked from God, he said to God something very interesting. Your children cannot take a bounty of good. Yeah. It doesn't say you cannot take enough rain. There's too much good. Good, not rain. Good. It's not, it's not so good. To be able to take good is also, for example... Somebody is sleeping, it was very dark. If you turn on very uh, strong light in his face, he cannot handle, the eyes cannot handle. Light is good, but too much light is not good. Then the rain stopped, cleared up, and the Jews were able to go and to collect and to revive themselves. Shimon ben Shotach was the leader of the Jewish people at that time, said, said to, said to, to Choni, Choni, if you were not Choni, I would have ex, uh, excommunicated you from the community. How dare you take an oath that you're not moving until some kind of forcing God, and if God wouldn't cooperate with you? He goes on with the whole explanation that, uh, and you know the story in the time of Elijah, that Elijah said, promised it's going to be a drought for three years, and it was a drought. He says, can you imagine you would be living in the time of Elijah? Elijah? Elijah swore that it's going to be a drought. You were swearing that it's going to rain. God will have to break one of the power or one of the oaths. You put God in our input. Basically, you don't, you don't put God like this. It's my way or thy way. Maybe it's not going to. Because when the Talmud tells the story, the Talmud says that Choni did like Habakkuk did. That he stood up on his place, he had a question, and he said to God, God, I need an answer. Why the Jews are suffering so much? Habakkuk lived in the time when the Assyrian kingdom was falling apart, and the Babylonian ki kingdom is coming, and he saw in his prophecy that the Babylonians are going to destroy the temple. You need to understand, before the destruction of the first temple, the idea of destroying, destroying the temple was unthinkable. Just the thought, it's like, it's like something that can never, God forbid, that America will cease to exist. Or Israel. It was unthinkable. Then, the, then the, when he saw in his prophecy it's going to happen, he couldn't believe it. So that he begged to God, what's going on here? And he says, I'm not moving until you give me an answer. But not only Havakov did it, not only Choni, somebody before them did it. And it was Moses, but we are. It's not even clear that he made a circle. But the Talmud puts it as he made a circle. Who did it before? He just said Moses. Moses, but we are. Well, Moses did a similar thing. God? Must have been no, during the plagues with Pharaoh. No? No. no. <laughs> Show me your... Uh... Show me your face. Or? I have some news for you. It's in our Parsha. Hashem helps me that even I read a different Daftar from somewhere else, it's always a connection to the Parsha of what you learn, what was there. What happened in the end of our Parsha? Baalotcha. Our Parsha is Baalotcha. On page 937. Miriam spoke, questioning, questioning Moses' behavior, right? That he separated from his wife. 
What happened to Miriam? Leprosy, Leprosy, Leprosy. right? Okay, to page, turn to page 939. Moses, to, uh, Aaron told Moses, what Aaron told Moses? Don't let her, on top of the page, 939. Don't let her remain at Sarah's supper, who is a source of ritual purity, like the dead. When a person's sister who comes out of his mother's womb is afflicted, half of his own flesh is consumed. You know what Aaron told them? Don't think Miriam is afflicted. If Miriam is afflicted and she's your sister, you're afflicted. He told Moses, it's like you have to ask. You came from the same... The three leaders, the Troika of the Jewish people in the desert was Moses, Aaron, and Miriam, right? Told them, if Miriam is, Miriam is afflicted, that's our problem. It's reflecting on us. What Moses did? Take Take Moshe cried out to God saying, please God, please heal her. That's it. The shortest prayer ever. Came no reform, no law. Please God, please heal her. The Talmud puts it like way. Moses put a circle around them and he said, God, you're helping your worlds. I'm not moving from here until you help them. Three places, people were standing in one place and said, God, before I need an answer now, this minute. Why a circle? What's the idea about the circle? Maybe put a triangle. Put a box. Why a circle? What's unique about the circle? No beginning, no end. No beginning, no end. Beautiful. The Rebbe said something very interesting. What is no beginning? Everything is equal. Nothing is more, nothing is less. It's a Jew that approaches God that every mitzvah is equally important to. For example, most of us, Yom Kippur is much more important than regular Shabbos. The regular Shabbos is more important than regular day. For Yom Kippur, everybody goes to show. The show is much more full than Yom Kippur than regular Shabbos, right? Brit Mila, priest, everybody is doing the mitzvah. Other mitzvahs, no, but mitzvahs is a little less, Jewish wedding a little less. Not every mitzvah are equally. But there are some type of Jews, tzaddikim, if God asks me to do it, it doesn't make a difference what it is. I do it. That means a Jew of Messias Nefer, Jews of self, was ready for self-sacrifice. This type of a Jew gets a treatment it's all measure for measure. As you're going to learn in the Torah, by Moide Doritz, middle connected middle, measure for measure. If I'm all the way for God, God is all the way for me. If I make, if I say this is more important, that God also says this is less important, this is more important. He's doing what I do. I say, oh no, this request I'll put here, oh, later, this you can do now. God also says this request came from him, right, later. That's it. Then uh, it's written as the Mishnah Pirkei Avot says, if you make his will your will, he will make your will his will. Simple as that. There is a certain people who say, who are very dedicated, even in the world, like a president or leader, they say, whatever he wants goes. It doesn't make a difference. Whatever your will is my will. I saw marriage. You know, I said I'm, I made a decision in my marriage to, to do everything my husband wants. Simple as that. Then, then uh, this is the, the circle. Three people. Moses, Chavakuk, and Chonia Meagel are all on the same wavelength. Then we cannot put a circle and say to God, God, I swear, if not, I'm not moving. But we can, what we could do is, we, the Rebbe says, we could insist. We could say, we could say, yes, God, I want you to do it. And if it's too much, say, God, it's too much, not good for me. Too little, it's again not good for me. Is that the source of the whole concept of Mashiach now? 
The Rebbe spoke about it. What do you think I came up with this myself? <laughs> the Rebbe said that we learn from Choni Amagel is that you can require from God, yes. You can demand from God what you need. Because it's a mitzvah to ask from God you need. It's an obligation. What is prayer? Asking from God for my need. Not to go to show. Prayer means if I am a need, middle of the day, and I need something, I told God, says, God help me. That's what prayer is all about. If it's too little, I say, God, that's not what I asked for. I can ask again and ask again. And this is Chavakuk, Moses, and, uh, and, and Moses was answered. God told him seven days and uh, she should wait and then he'll cure. And she was cured, Miriam. Just out of curiosity, the, the Midrash that you cited from the Talmud, I think it's Rabbi Simlai, so where, where you're here at 12 uh, important points, 11, 10, 9, eventually gets oh, down to Simlai one. Says it. Yeah, yeah, very with, good. With yes. Habakkuk. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Isn't that just the opposite of what you just said, though, in terms of everything being equal? Isn't that the, the source? No, the question is, what is, what is the drive for everything? It's not so much that it's not equal. If you have faith, you do everything. Mm -hmm. That's the point. What it stands on. You see, when we meet a, a new person who never was connected to Judaism, cannot draw on the, the book. Literally, throwing the book. I think from there it's coming, the expression, throwing the book, throwing the Bible on you. Because it's too heavy. You have to tell them where to start. What's, what's, what's the most important piece? That we say, start with this. If you start with this, this is the gate to, go, to move forward. But eventually, you need to understand what you tell a person what's the basics and what's the ultimate. The basics is tzadik be monatoi faith. The ultimate is that everything should be equal. You understand what I'm mm -hmm. saying? Everything should be equal is the ultimate. That you should, every mitzvah from God should be equally important to you. Oh, yes. The idea is God's will Every God's commandment, will. every request of God if it's a small request or a big request, if God is the one who asks me for it, then I have to do it. From this point of view, it doesn't make a difference what I disobey. If I disobey the smallest things, if I disobey the king's rule, the king is correct, I'm in trouble. That's awesome. I, I might not get a big punishment for it, but the idea, the, I, I slapped it in his face. It's a slap in his face. He asked me to do something and I didn't do it. You want to turn a little bit the air condition? Just a drop. I think that's also in the prepared vote. That uh, you, yeah, don't know which, you don't know what this is. That's important. the same idea. Yes, 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 yes. They're all important, I guess. <laughs> no, when you say you don't know what's more important, what's less important, that you apply that there is more important and less important. And still, you should do all of them. Because there is more important, less important. But from the point of view that it's all the will of God, then it doesn't make a difference. You understand what I'm saying? But there is a hierarchy now. That's what I'm saying. And the gravity of the mitzvah, so to speak, sure. there, is, there is a hierarchy. But from the point of view that God asked me to do, it doesn't really make a difference. If I ask for my child to bring me a cup of water or not to take drugs, from the point of view, what's more important, for sure the drugs is more important. But from the point of view that I asked them to do something, it doesn't really make a difference. From the a mitzvah for honoring your father and mother, it doesn't make a difference what the mitzvah is. You have to honor your father and mother. If it's a couple of other, or doing the worst thing. But whether your father will be more upset or punish you more or less, that for sure will be a different. You understand what I'm saying? It's not a contradiction. That's how you look at it. Mm -hmm. The consequences are different, but the act of not listening is the same. All listening. Now the the after starts the last verse of chapter two, and then chapter three, fifteen twenty three. God, although he may not seem, for he is in his holy heavenly abode. Nevertheless, the entire earth is silent in trepidation before him, for he rules over it. We might not be seen, so to speak. Habakkuk says, "I cannot see God." But we feel him everywhere. Everybody is afraid of him. This is, by the way, Hashem Bechal Kocho asked me Panaf Kolaretz. In many synagogues, they use it as the verse that they put on top of the ark. This is the, the verse they put. We put here a much 
friendly of us. It's also coming from Aftorah, the beginning of Aftorah. It's the Aftorah of Parshat Toldot. The end of the Aftorah, actually. Uh, no, no, the Aftorah, the beginning. The beginning on page 1384. 1384. From Malachi. This is from, they bring from Havako. We take Malachi. Malachi says in number two, I loved you, says God. O Afti Eschem Omar Hashem. That's what we put it. That's the question. What kind of a synagogue is that? I love you, says God. Or God is in his abode. The whole world is scared of him. What do we say? Love or fear? But, but this is love in the past tense. I know, I know. That's okay, he still loves us. <laughs> it, it, did you take it directly or did you change the... No, I took it as it is. And we don't change your verses. That's what it Just is. Ask it. The Baal Shem Tov, the Maggid of Mezrich, the first Torah they did from his Rebbe, the Baal Shem Tov, was Afti Eschem Oma Hashem. You have to love another Jew. Love whoever God loves. That was the first Torah that the Maggid of Mezrich, the disciple of Hashem Tov, heard from his Rebbe, the Baal Shem Tov. And he came to him. And the Maggid was a huge scholar that the Baal Shem Tov told him the most simple word. My friend, you want to know what that's all about? They ha came Chavakok, he put it in one thing. Love so your father. That's what his father told him. The Baal Shem Tov. Yeah. No, that's not what the father, his father told him. But he said father told him. His father told him, fear only from God. Fear and only God. And I read with you. Father two told things. him. two things. He didn't tell him love every Jew. Told him love every Jew? Mm -hmm. I don't remember that. The, the, the word Anochi, uh, I, is that only used by God, or can that be used by others? Could be used by others. Too. Okay. Could be used, yeah. Now, and that's actually where we're going to the next, in the third verse, but it's the same idea. Do we sell love or we sell fear? What's, what is the em emphasis, really? Okay, number two. One? Okay, uh, yeah, the prophet Habakkuk's prayer for having inadvertently erred. Al shigyonot. Shigyonot in Hebrew is the word mishge, comes the word mistakes. Page 1523, number, it's in second, the second verse, three, chapter three, number oh. one. He, he's apologizing for his mistake. What means his mistakes? For complaining to God. He wanted to tell him for complaining on his own. He wanted to know where, where's, where Moshiach is going to go, what's going on here. Oh God, I heard your message at the long exile, and I became terrified. I became terrified. Yeah, go ahead. Oh God, during these years, sustain the nation who are your handiwork. Make it known during those years that even in anger, you will remember to be merciful to them. Oh, God, he says, God, Shomati Shimacho Yorisi, I heard you, God. He didn't see God, he heard God. And therefore, he was afraid. He was terrified by the news that he heard. But more than just by the news, by God. That's why he says, God is the abode and the whole world is killed of him, right? And he says, God, when you take the Jews on a long exile, he understood there's going to be a long journey. He says, rachem tiska. When you are angry, remember to have mercy on your children. We use this word, beroges rachem tiska, in the, in the high holiday prayers. Now, before we continue any further, there is a note in the bottom, 3-2. You want to read, Dr. Lang? 3-2 in the bottom. I heard your message. Mm -hmm. I became terrified. Rabbi Shimon rejoiced and said, I heard your message. I became terrified. At that time, it was appropriate to have fear. But in our case, everything depends on love. Wow, that's from the Zohar. Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai says, Chava Kuk says, at that time, I heard you, I heard your message, I became terrified. Now, it's a different world. In our case, everything depends on love. It's a relationship of love of God. That's what Kabbalah brought to the world. That's what Hasidus brought to the world. Was that love. before or after he left the cave and was <laughs> killing people with his, his eyes, so to speak? Obviously, I don't know. <laughs> That's a good question, exactly when you said it. 
But let's continue the note. At first, the Rebbe is asking, go ahead. At first glance. At first glance, Rabbi Shimon's comment is difficult to understand. How can he suggest that Habakkuk's statement is no longer relevant to us when it forms part of the Haftorah read by all communities and is thus connected with the giving of the Torah? Yeah, we read it on the second day of Shavuot to every Jew, and, and Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochais basically says it's not relevant anymore. Now it's all about love. Turn to page 1524 in the bottom, on the, the left side. Fear is an emotion. Fear is an emotion of distance and love, a feeling of closeness. Mm -hmm. Hearing gives a person a more distant impression of the thing being perceived, whereas seeing makes a much deeper and closer impression on the person. Mm -hmm. Habakkuk stated that he heard God expressing a sentiment of distance, which is why he experienced fear of God. I heard your message, I became terrified. Rabbi Shimon, on the other hand, was famed for seeing godly revelation. Rabbi Shimon said, I see now what no man has seen since the day that Moshe went up the second time on Mount Sinai. Therefore, his predominant emotion was a feeling of closeness and love of God. In the final analysis, we see that both fear and love are entirely valid. One's emotions simply depend on how close to God one feels. Aha. Uh -huh. And there is fear of God, and there is love of God. If you hear God, if you are distant from God, you have a fear of God. The closer you get to God, the more you love Him. Why, is, why do you have to have both of them? Everyone has both. The question is, what's the, the main thing is? It's not, we talked about it many times. The point is, what's the main thing? Is the main thing the love of God or fear of God? As Rabbi Shem Yochai says, before it was a time of fear of God. Now it's a time of love of God. That's why the Hasidic movement philosophy is to stress love of God. Because you love, you, love is a much stronger motivator than fear. <laughs> fear paralyzes you. Mm -hmm. Love motivates you. You won't motivate the Jews, you don't want to. That's why there's a difference between the verse and the, and the Ark or in the other synagogues. It's about fear of God. What are you preaching? What are you selling? Fear of God or love of God? Fear of Jews or love of Jews? It's, it's, it's the whole editor is a different editor. Joy or fear or being scared of God. Okay, we are now in number three. God, page 1523, number three. Oh God, I heard your message of the no, law. No, no. God, Next one, the, three. Oh, God, three. Came. God came to the Jewish people after they passed through Taman, the land of Adam. Indeed, the Holy One came when they passed through Mount Paran, which is close to Adam. Then, when the Jewish people defeated Sichon and Og, God's splendor covered the heavens and his acclaim filled the earth. Okay, what is happening here? Chavakuk is trying to bring up all the miracles that God did for the Jewish people. And he starts on Mount Sinai. It start, it's kind of an awakening mercy from God by reminding him all the good things that he did for the Jewish people and reminding Mount Sinai that the Jewish people were ready to receive the Torah. What we, you remember something like these verses in the Bible, in the five books of Moses? Hashem came from Taman and, he, and he, then he went to, 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 he came from Mount Paran. Hashem is in I bow with Mr. Lomo of Pia Malkoti. You know the Medrash that says that God offered the Torah to every nation and nobody wanted to take it? Okay. From where the Medrash comes? What's based on? Based on the words in the Bible. In the book of, in the Parshas Azino. In Parshas Zezot Abraha. At the end of the Torah. Open page 1357. Number two. 1357, number two. 1357. Yes, in top of the page. Read the top of the page. Okay. Please. From the beginning. 
And this is the blessing which Moshe, a man of God, gave to the children of Israel shortly before his death. Mm -hmm. He said, he first said his words of praise about God. God came out from Sinai to meet the Jewish people, and he shined his glory to them after coming from Seir, where the children of Esau had declined to accept the Torah. He appeared to them after coming from Mount Paran, where the children of Ishmael had declined to accept the Torah. He came to the Jewish people along with some of the holy Mayrids, and he gave to them a fury law written with his right hand. Okay. See what's going on here? Almost the same words. Came from Paran, came from mm -hmm. this. Mm -hmm. The message is nobody else wanted to receive the Torah. Then Chavakuk is trying to wake God's mercy in the Jews. He says to the God, you remember who were the only customers? Who was ready to take the Torah? Only the Jews. That's what he's saying. And that's the same language he's using here in the Torah. Similar language, not the same, but a similar language. Go back to our Torah, 1527. Um, I'm sorry. Okay, we are number, we'll continue on number <laughs> four. He continues to mention the miracles that God did for the Jewish people. And he says, by the walls of Sihon and Og, if the whole world world they saw the splendor of God, they were the big giants, and Moses knocked them out. Number four, the glow. The glow of the pillar of fire which accompanied the Jewish people at night was as light as day. They were empowered with the might of his hand, and there with them were the tablets which had been previously concealed on high and were inside the ark of his strength. In front of the ark, pestilence loomed to destroy the Canaanites, and when the ark came, fiery coals came out to annihilate them. Okay. Then what is he saying? He says that he mentioned the old thing that God sent the clouds of glory. And they cleaned up the place. And the Ark of the Covenant with the two tablets were eaten inside. Were bringing, they, were, they were fighting for the Jewish people the war. The Jews did not fight the war. But the, the word you need to understand, that's poetry. This chapter is poetry. The, in poetry, there is a lot of parentheses, what it means. You understand what I'm saying? I remember every time I used to read the Torah from the second day of Shuas, you couldn't make sense of it. Without the, without the commentary, the, in English, they're putting the in parentheses, the commentary, you wouldn't make, be able to make sense at all about it. Go ahead, number, f number six. When the ark would stop, the land was conquered, later to be measured out to the tribes when the ark looked at the land and the nations were displaced. The ancient mountains of Canaanite aristocracy were shattered, eternal hills were humbled because those that ran the ways of the world belong to God. Basically, the Jewish people conquered the world with the power of the ark. That's what he's really saying. He says it's a nice word, but that's one. Now, there is many, for may, may every verse there is other commentaries, but that's a, the basic commentary. Let's continue, number seven. I saw that God did not intervene on Israel's behalf when they came under the rule of the tents of King Kushan not because he was lacking in strength, but due to the inappropriate behavior of Israel. For when Israel did not did repent in the days of Gideon, God caused the coverings of the Midian's royal tents to tremble in terror. He says like this, I saw that many times the Jewish people will not, God did not interfere on behalf of the Jewish people. But not because God couldn't do it, and because the Jews didn't deserve it. Because the moment the Jews did tshuva, God said, said Gideon, right? He revealed himself to Gideon, and then Gideon came and saved the Jewish people. That basically, Chavakuk, who lives almost by the end of the first temple, is bringing a, 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 it's a long monologue to bring out all the miracles, what, the history of the Jewish people. It's almost like Moses in the beginning of Deuteronomy. This is true, yes, 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 yes. What it is, is more than everything, it's reminding the Jews what they need to do, their history and reminding God, speaking to God, all the good things about the Jews, so to speak. Awakening the love of God to the Jewish people. That's what it's all about. 
It's, it's, a, it's called a limutzchus. To find something good to say about the Jewish people. You know that once a, a, a cantor came to the Rebbe, he says, I'm going to Davon on the high holidays. The Rebbe told him, you know how the prayers begin? Ma'atovu o'alecha Yaakov, mishkenotecha Yisrael. How good are you? Ten to, are you ten Jacob? You're uh, dwelling, dwelling Israel. The Rebbe said, the prayer starts with a compliment of the Jewish people. You want to stick to God? First we'll say something nice about these kids. Then we'll talk. I want something from you. I say, you know, your children are amazing. Then we can talk. Now you open my heart. You start, oh, I need this, I need this. What is this? A prophet, what's the job of a prophet? By the way, to say this line can only say somebody that lives like this. It's not just came up with a brilliant idea. Somebody that his life is dedicated to the Jewish people can say such a line that the prayer begins with the to the Jewish people. He spoke once about Jeremiah. Jeremiah was a harsh prophet. But the first prophecy he gave to the Jewish people, not that he got by himself, gave to the Jewish people was a beautiful compliment about the Jewish people. So, I remember to you the, day, the old days that you went after me in the desert. Famous line, right? That was the first line, according to many commentaries, that Jeremiah gave to the Jewish people. And I saw it, I said, if the, if the Rebbe would see it, he would love it. Because that's exactly what the Rebbe is. And that's what here the prophet is doing. He's trying to, to awaken the old love of God to the Jewish people. So he's doing the opposite of what a lot of prophets do. Prophets usually speak from God to us. He's speaking from us to God, basically. It's Havakuk, really, the good point. Havakuk is basically from us to God, yes. He screams out to God, God! What's good? That's all. The first chapter is complaining to God. The second chapter, God answers him. And now it's a prayer that he's trying to awaken in him. So he's almost the new Moses. There's a famous story in the Talmud. Rabbi Shmuel Kohen Godel, a high priest, says, once I walked in, lifnai velifnim, I entered the Holy of Holies, and I saw God. It became a very famous song. And he told me, God told the high priest, Ishmoel bni bocheni, Ishmoel, my son, give me a blessing. God is asking from Ishmoel, from the high priest, a blessing. What was, what do you, God is asking for you, what do you mean? Uh, that you bless yourself. What did he told him? Who? God? What did Shmuel, the high priest, told God? God is asking for a blessing. Oh, well, how do you answer him? Yeah. Bless, bless his people. He wrote him for Necho. He wrote him for Necho. That your mercy should overcome your anger. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. Okay. What does this mean? Pulled out of God the mercy. That's exactly what the Roige Zachem Tisker, what you read before, that's exactly what Chavakuk was doing. You're right. Chavakuk was speaking to God. You're absolutely right. Most of the prophets came in the name of God's screaming and the Jews. Chavakuk stood, took this God, the Jewish people's side. Speaking to God. Okay, that's why the 13th principle from the third, from the 12th principle and the 13th principles of faith, waiting for Moshiach, Chabaku gave us. If, if, if it will take a little longer, wait, 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 don't give up. So, why does he have such a minor role in, in our, relatively, in the, all this history? That because, job, he, I mean. because he was probably speaking a little bit, you know. We have your own argument with God. You no, don't. I'm saying it, it's, 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 it, it's such a, a, a flip on some of the other approaches, and it's so profound. Why wasn't he given... That's all he had to say. Well, that's all he was given to say. I mean, I mean you know, that's all I mean, I'm just curious as to why that that's might be. That's a good be. question. Because most of the job, most of the problem is, is not to convince God to love the Jewish people, is to convince the Jewish people to love God. But... But sometimes you have to remind and compliment the other right, people. You're, you're absolutely right. The other prophets also did it. It's not like they did only one and not the other. Number seven, I saw... I saw that God did not intervene on Israel's behalf. Oh, we read it, I'm okay. sorry. 
Were you were, were you angry with the River Jordan when she split? Uh, when you split it, oh God! Were you furious at the river? Were you incensed at the Reed Sea when you split it? No. You split the water so that you could ride your horses with your chariot of salvation to redeem the Jewish people. Again, he mentions all the miracles that God made to the Jewish people. He said, you didn't do it out of anger. You did it because you cared for the Jewish people. Okay, number 10. And where are we? Number nine. 10? No, nine. 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 All right. Your bow was fully unsheathed to fight against the Canaanites to fulfill your promise made to the patriarchs to give the land of Israel to the tribes. Thus in the desert you split the earth open into rivers so that the Jewish people would have water to live, enabling them to reach the land. And God is saying, basically, he puts all on the table. All the miracles that God made to the Jewish people. He split the earth to get out water. He gave the land of Israel to the Jews because he promised to the patriarchs. Number 10. The mountains, or Arnon, shook when they saw you and moved together to crush the enemy. A stream of water went by from the well to bring up the remains of the enemy so that the people could see the victory and the deep well cried aloud to announce the miracle. On that day, God's powerful hands were exalted and esteemed for everybody recognized his miracles. When was it? When is this miracle took place? When was that? I know they were in the valley, mm -hmm. the two mountains mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. came together. Mm -hmm. When was it, yeah? When was it? Well, this one is probably close to when Moses wanted to ask God to see him in the face of his... No? I think. It's... Uh, on page 10, 1007. 1005 actually. You almost never, it's like a little piece that it's being lost sometimes between the Jewish people, between the learning classes. For the journey, the miracles encamped at Arnon. Page 1005. You see it? Mm -hmm. The new chap, the new parable. No, further during the miracles and yes, 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 yes. Right. Spot. The children. Uh, I'm sorry. What? Where are we? Right there. Oh, the children of Israel traveled, <coughs> and they camped at Ovos. They traveled from Ovos and camped in Ayim Havarim. No more. Just move on. Yeah. Don't worry about the names. Okay. In the wilderness between Moab and the land of Amorites. All right. Okay, and from, from there, there they, they traveled and they encamped on the other side of the Okay, Armand. number 13, from there they, they, they traveled. Okay. Continue, Which is continue. in a desert extending from the Amorite border. At Amoron was the Milevite border between Moab and the Amorites. Okay, turn the page. About this miraculous encampment. It will be told when God's wars are recounted. He gave a gift of miracles at the Sea of Reeds, and they were matched by the miracles of the valleys of Ar Arnon. The blood of the Amorites was spilling into the valleys when the mountains actually moved, crushing the Amorites. And it turned to settle at Ar, leaving... You know, we'll stop right here, and we'll read the classic question, what miracle occurred at Arnon? Uh, See it on the Rashi, the, the, it's, on, it's on page 1006, mm -hmm. classic question, the left column. This Go is ahead. Rashi, right? Yes. The mountains were high and the valley between them was deep and narrow. The mountains were so close to each other that a person standing on the mountain on one side of the valley could speak to his friend standing on the mountain on the other side. The route of the Jewish people passed along the valley. The route, Go ahead, I'm sorry, go ahead. The Amorites said, when the Jewish people enter the valley to pass through, we'll come out of the caves in the mountains above them and kill them with arrows and catapult stones. There were caves in the rock on the Moabite side of the valley, 
and directly opposite, opposite the caves there were protrusions on the mountain on the Amorite side. When the Jewish people were about to pass through the mountain, moved toward the mountain of Moab, the protrusions entered the caves, killing the Amorites. This is the meaning of the words, it turned to settle at Ar. The mountain veered from its place and moved toward the side of the Moabite border and attached itself to it. It was thus leaning against the border of Moab. The Jewish people passed on top of the mountains, and they only became aware of the miracles through the well water that entered the valley, as the Torah continues from there to the well. How did this occur? God said, Who will inform my children of these miracles? As the proverb goes, If you give a small child bread, inform his mother. So after they passed through the mountains, returned to their places, and the well water went down into the valley. It brought the blood of the people who were killed, their arms and their limbs, and carried them around the camp. When the Jewish people saw this, they burst into song. Now I understand. This miracle is not so famous, right? Yeah. Yeah. The Jewish people, that was by the end, before they entered the land of Israel, the Canaanites were hiding in the caves, ready to attack the Jews, and God made it that they would be crushed and killed before, and the Jews would never even know that it was a miracle. There's a concept in Jewish law, Ein Baal Anes Makir Ben Iso. The person with a miracle took place with him doesn't even know that a miracle took place. He goes on with life, that nothing happened. He doesn't know that behind there was a cow was a, almost, almost killed him and God saved him in a split of a second. He doesn't even know that God wanted to make sure that the Jews know that the river brought the limbs of the people who were killed. Oh, they were enemies here. That's how they discovered it was a miracle. Yes. That's what Habakkuk now is mentioning this miracle because he wants to, again, mention a miracle that God did for the Jewish people, 1524. Now we're going to number 11. Go ahead. In the days of mm -hmm. Joshua, the sun and the moon stood still in their place. And Israel went to victory in the light of your arrows and the glow of your spearheads. In anger you paced the earth and trampled nations in rage. In the days of King Hiskiyahu, you came out to deliver your people, to deliver your anointed one. Through, an, through your angel, you crushed the heads of the wicked houses, sans Kariv, barring the foundation of their power, even to its core, which is in the, the neck, so it will never rise again. With Sanhari's own spear, he pierced the heads of his senior officials in his open cities. They had stormed towards us, towards intending to scatter us, but we instead scattered them. They planned joy. Their their planned joy was turned on their heads like that of the Egyptians who wanted to devour their victim in secret in the desert. But you, your clouds, which were like horses, trampled them in the sea together with piles of mighty water. Basically, he says, he mentions the miracle that God did to Hiskiyahu. Sancherif came with his army and wanted to destroy, destroy Jerusalem on the night of Pesach, right? <coughs> and that night, they all died. Mm. How they died? The, the Talmud describes it that they, they hear the shira from the Malochim. They hear that the, the angels praise God and uh, it was such a high thing that human beings cannot take. They passed out. They died. Whatever it is, they died. The point is, he brings out, he says it was like going out from Egypt. He brings all the miracles that God took, that took place. I heard something that caused my heart within my abdomen to tremble. My lips quivered at the news. Decay entered my bones, and I shuddered whenever I stood. I heard that when I will come to the land of Israel, which was supposed to be during a time of rest, it will turn to a day of affliction to come up against a people of troops, Gog. He was he heard about the war of Gog and Magog. The war will come before Moshiach comes, and he was very worried, Havakuk. He says, my body is decaying. I'm scared, I'm trembling. But, he says, at, at that, that time, time, Israel's military will still be like a fig tree that has not blossomed with no fruit growth on the vines, like a lean olive produce, like fields that produce no harvest. In the wake of the Babylonian exile, Israel will still be small in number, like flocks cut off from the pen, 
with no cattle in the stalls, so how will they stand against mighty Gog? That's why he's so trembling. He says, how will the Jews survive with the Babylonian army? They'll never make it. That's why he was so scared and so trembling. Not for himself, not because he heard God, because he heard the news. Is, when he's using the term Gog here, is he referring to Gog and Magog in the future, or is he referring to the Babylonians, or both? It could, it could be both. I mean, Babylonian at that time, if Moshiach would come, that's, that Babylonian would be Gog and Magog. Gog and Magog means a strong king, a strong army, a strong nation, come against the Jewish people. It could be Gog and Magog, could be Hitler, could be, could be Syria, could be anybody. You understand what I'm saying? But the they, name is only a name. But, but this exile is, is necessary to keep the, the Jewish people alive too. Why? God's exile of the Jews because he's gonna he goes with them. But they're not with an exile. <laughs> well that wasn't exile. Yet Yet <laughs> Where's where's number eighteen? Yet I will rejoice. Where's eighteen then? Oh yet I uh, will rejoice that God will help. I will be joyful at the power of uh, the God of my salvation. While we are small, God Almighty will be for us like a giant army. He will make our feet swift like the deers and lead us upon the hilltops to catch the enemy. This song should be given to the Levite conductor of the temple music, who should play it with my designated melody. That means to say, in the end of the day, Chavakuk says, I know all the big bad news, I'll still rejoice by God. Because ultimately, it's going to work out. Ultimately, it's going to work out. Wow, but he looks by